Welcome to the Brand Clarity Podcast, hosted by Visions to Images and Susie Libertor. The Brand Clarity Podcast highlights several different topics, including entrepreneurship, franchises, and digital marketing trends. Visions to Images helps corporations and franchises with their branding, website, paid advertising, and digital marketing. All right. Hello, everybody. Today on the podcast, I have Tammy Rogers, president and franchisor of Paparazzi. And that is P-U-P as in paparazzi, because she is all about the pet grooming industry. And I'm super excited to have her on. Welcome, Tammy. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So tell me a little bit about how you got involved with this industry and then how you got involved with the franchising. So amazing. I started very young. (laughs) I started when I was about 14, 15 years old, right in there. Um, Always had a love for animals, um, had dogs, obviously, my whole life. And I started kind of trying to groom them myself at home. And my dad was like, you know, you know, maybe you could do something like this. You know, I think he was trying to push me to like go to work. Right. You know, you're getting up there, getting close to that 16 year old age. (laughs) <laughs> and um, they bought me some clippers and did some things. And, you know, I can say I, I, I made an honest attempt at grooming dogs. But then I met with a poodle breeder that was local in the valley. Uh-huh. And she showed me basically how to groom a poodle. I then and my parents helped me invest in some more expensive shears, things that could actually do the job better. And I just kind of become self-taught after that. Um, I learned from books. We didn't have videos back then. I call it the dark ages. Yeah. <laughs> you know, call it the eighties, right? We didn't have books. No. Uh, we only had books, I should say. We didn't have videos. So you couldn't watch anybody. You just kind of had to learn by reading and attempting. And then I didn't even have anybody really to critique me, but kind of worked into the industry where I had a friend who owned a pet shop and she kind of took me in and said, you know, hey, I'll let you groom some dogs. And she, she had already probably was about a year or two ahead of me in in that learning process. And then she taught me some things. And so it's just kind of evolved over time. You know, my dad would give me clients. He would tell people, Hey, my daughter grooms dogs. Can she groom your dog? And I don't even remember what I charged back then. It was probably (laughs) next to nothing, but it was money. It was a little bit of mad money for me. And when I look back at it and I look at old photos and stuff of me sitting on a back patio on the ground with a big dog, because I couldn't put a big dog on a table, you know, I mean, I just, I had zero tools, like proper tools to really do this, but it, it taught me to appreciate where the industry is and where we are. And what we can, you know, what we, what I've learned. So, I mean, I came from like a very humble beginning to now grown into a franchise where I feel like there hasn't been an aspect of this industry that I haven't done or touched. And I feel like that's something that I can really, you know, bring to my franchise clients now, as far as in the training aspect or in the support avenue. In 2015, I franchised. I went mobile in 2010. It was if you want to hear the story part of it and back it up a little bit, I came from a divorce um, and it was kind of a rough divorce, very rough patch in my life. Um, and I spent about two years trying to find myself, sure, absolutely. trying to figure out what I was going to do with myself, decided that, you know, I had, I mean, I literally, I moved back home. It was very, <laughs> it, it was very humbling at that point. It was like, wow, this is like the bottom, bottom. I have to go, I have to go back home. I can't raise my two kids by myself. I can't afford to. Right. could afford to live on my own. Even with the, the help of child support, I couldn't. I kind of had to re- regroup and it took me a couple of years. I had was lucky enough out of this divorce to attain um, a 401k from my ex and it sat in the bank and those for those two years. And that was back in 2010. So if everybody remembers, our economy started spiraling in 2008. And by 2010, it was still heading down. It wasn't improving. And I thought about opening a business. And probably in the worst economy, people would think you were nuts. You're going to do what? And you've never done mobile. But I did research on it. And mobile made sense to me. It was something I hadn't touched. And I wanted to create this really cool Hollywood-themed, I don't even know how to explain it, like a Hollywood-themed presentation. So like when you rolled up, 
there was like this first impression, right? They're like, wow, that is so cool. And then to give my pet parents an experience about their pet being a star. And so that's kind of how it evolved. And the name paparazzi came from my kids. Um, Both of my kids were in the entertainment industry. I was that crazy mom driving to LA Every couple of weeks we had both my kids landed agents in Los Angeles. That was their first, they didn't get anything local. They landed LA agents. So all the work was in LA. So they, we never knew when we were going to have to quickly pack up, throw things in the car and drive to Los Angeles to try to catch an interview at four in the afternoon. Cause you know, it takes us six, six and a half hours from here. Mike, I was trying to come up with this really cool name. And paparazzi came from the Hollywood industry, the, you know, the bright lights, the red carpet, that whole theme and my love for pets. And so instead of calling it paparazzi, like the song, we called it paparazzi and that, and we made the ticket line for them where your pets, the star. And we literally, when we sell a franchise and we do a grand opening or we participate in events, we literally roll out a red carpet. We literally put the brass sanctions up, like, you know, like you're going to Hollywood and try to give it that fancy theme where people get their dog's pictures taken on the red carpet. The back of our vans have a, what we call a step and repeat wall where they can stand in front of it for a photo op. And uh, that's kind of how paparazzi evolved. Yeah. Let's talk about this divorce really quick. And that okay. kind of just to kind of, give some insight and stuff, you know, going through a divorce is incredibly hard. I, I think I wrote a blog post way back when I was going through a divorce and I was like, what's worth, what, what is worse death or a divorce? Right. And it's like, right. go through a lot of the similar stages and all of that. My story is very similar to yours kind of to some extent, but not completely, but it was like one of those things. I, I have a child and a, he's autistic. And I was like, I need to do this, right? Like I've always had freelance and business mindset, but I really dove in because I had to take care of myself. People were like, why don't you just go back to work? And I'm like, no, that's not going to work for me. Right. And I needed that flexibility and right. it to be able to fulfill my goals that I've always had. And, you know, still to this day, it's like, you look, you look at all the progress that you've made and everything. Like I wouldn't have changed any of it. Um, You know, and I love being the business owner and all of that. And it's like, sometimes you look back at it and you're just like, wow, you know, it's, it's impressive to see how much you've grown and changed and evolved. So hats off to you for overcoming (laughs) such, no, it's, it's true. It's, it's a hard time to go through no matter what, what the circumstances are. And, and then coming out and developing a business and really pushing it and having the kids and everything, it is one of the hardest things to do. So I get that. <laughs> and, you know, and I appreciate that because I'm, and I do think a lot of people get that, but I think because I've lived it for so long, I just think, well, you know what? I did it. No big deal. But then when I look back, they, like when I have to reflect, that's where I see you know, the overcoming of, of a lot and trying, and I think trying to go back to those dark moments where it wasn't just, you know, arguments or we just didn't agree. It was volatile. It was unhealthy. It, this is what kept me stuck financially. I, I had, I had stayed for financial reasons because I knew I couldn't go anywhere. Right. I was stuck. I felt stuck. Not that my parents would never have taken me home or back, that my parents were the most wonderful people on this earth, but I didn't want to do that again because my first divorce, which was to the kids' father, was a good, it was a, it was an amicable situation. It was more my decision. Then that decision came with later down the road was, was that the right decision, right? Should I have hung in there? Whatever, you know, should I have done more to work on the relationship? Or did I just take that quick, easy exit strategy? So I was bound and determined that with this second marriage, I was going to stay come, you know, that, that whole taking of the vows, I was going to make those vows matter this time that I should have made matter the first time. Right. But I was going to make that matter a second go round, even though it was completely unhealthy. Um, I mean, literally, I am not the person to stay in that kind of relationship. My personality is not that. 
But when you're with somebody who knows just how to chip away at your self-worth and your who you are, and then when you look back on that and you go, who was I then? I mean, I really don't remember who I was. Sure. And it took me two years to go. I was so refreshed once I got out and was like, I can't believe I stayed that long. Our marriage wasn't good from shortly after the I do. So for eight years, I he chipped at it and just did terrible things to that even affected my kids. My kids will even talk about it today. I mean, and they're adults and um, they know what he went through. But it literally was this moment of humbling going back home in my 40s, which I thought was crazy. And I thought, but my parents begged. They're like, please just come home. You're fine. We we will figure this out. Just come home. And they moved me out in a weekend mm-hmm. and got me out of there. And he went out of town, luckily, and he was going to be out of town for that weekend. When he came back, I was gone. You know, it was really one of those things. But I mean, it was a very dangerous situation. It was not healthy at all. And I look for two years, struggled to what am I going to do with my life? And I did go back to work. I did go back to the grooming shops. I mean, that's what I know. That's what I'm good at. But after being in those grooming shops for almost a year, I was like, why am I working for somebody who's barely, you know, not much older than my children (laughs) and they're my manager. And not that I can't respect somebody who's younger. It's not about that. It's the fact that I feel like I brought more to the table in customer service, but I was never in the environment that I was in, was never allowed to use my own way because they kind of kept you locked away in a, I called it the fishbowl because I was in like this glass <laughs> glass thing where everybody could peer in and watch you, but I could never communicate with anybody. Like they brought me the dogs. I handed, they came and got the dogs and handed them back to the pet parents. I couldn't have that, that relationship. And I really feel like I'm a relationship building person. Sure. So it was really hard for me to work in that environment. And I thought, and everybody kept saying, Tammy, why don't you just work for somebody? You know, why don't you just do it yourself? I mean, you know how to do this. You've been doing this at that time. I was doing it 30 years. They're like, you just need to, you just need to do this yourself. And that's kind of where the, that forward motion, I knew I had that money sitting in the bank Yeah. and I thought, well, what can I, can I invest that money in myself? Can I make it happen? God love my father. He's just, he passed last year, but he always believed in me. Always. He told me you will never fail. And I, I have it. And here's the thing, even if you do quote unquote fail, you get back up no matter what, like there's little falls that we might hit or failures, right? Like some things, but I don't look at, I don't look at divorce as a failure neither anymore. It's not, it's not a failure. It's a lesson and it's, 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 I I don't regret it. Right. It brings us to who we are today. And, you know, I've, we'll talk about franchising and marketing in a minute, but I've gone through um, a lot of therapy and stuff. And no, the thing that I've learned the most is we can only count on ourselves. We have to take care of ourselves. We have to do everything for ourselves, no matter if we're married or not, like anything can come crashing down at any moment. So we really have to take care of ourselves and go after our goals. And that's women because women, I feel like are missing and lacking in those areas because there's this stereotype that we have to rely on men and we can't do things and all of that. Like that's a whole nother topic in itself. Right. (laughs) But But it's like one of those things that we as women need to be more overcoming and understand a lot more of so that we can help empower and build other women up. You're right. And that is true. And now that I've, you know, stepped away from that and have been away from it for a long period of time, I do get that question a lot. Like, how are you angry, you know, from that relationship? Are you bitter? And I said, absolutely not. Because that going through that, that was a lesson. I'm a hundred percent. I believe life is about lessons. I believe that I was in that situation as hard as it was at the time to learn something, to take something from it, to give me that push to do something different. And that is what catapulted my business. And so it come from a moment of yuckiness and uncertainty to look at what I've accomplished over a period of time. And so I don't have any regret. I don't, it it was the, it was what I had to go through in my life to do what I do now. And that's okay. I love it. 
Hey there, I want to interrupt this episode with a quick message. If you're listening to this podcast episode and want to learn about branding your franchise or small business, then go to brandingbridge.com. That's branding-bridge.com. So, all right, let's talk business now. So what makes you unique? What makes your company so unique? I think what makes my company unique and you know i don't know a lot about others to compare it to but i firmly believe i have a strong hold of knowledge and experience whether it and it's not just yeah i have a great business mindset i have hands on experience where i feel like i can offer any new franchisee i can help them in any aspect of their of their struggle whether it be does this dog look good? <laughs> they could actually ask me that. I'm not sure in another company that may be offering the same situation, same question, could that person that's handling their franchisees actually be able to help them in that department? Right. So from customer relations to what a good haircut looks like to understanding instructions, because again, when you're mobile, you literally are in the field by yourself. You are, whether you are a, a newbie groomer that might be just got out of grooming school and only been doing it for a couple years, I know how I evolved, right? So I evolved a little bit differently than other people, but I know that these groomers go into a salon environment where they have multiple groomers that they can quickly ask a question to and say, hey, I don't quite know how to get this head to look better. I mean, I feel like there's a there's a, a lifeline to me that if you know, somebody said, Hey, I'm struggling with this dog's head. Can you give me a pointer? Or, you know, they could always call me and ask, or they could always email me or whatever, or send me a video. I feel like I can help them out in that. And I also feel like I can diffuse customer issues, right? When somebody has got a complaint, I'm all about customer service. And I feel like I'm good at diffusing that without allowing emotions to be get, to get involved. I feel like people have um, in business have a lot of knee jerk reactions and they don't want to settle something in 40 years. What I've learned from most pet parents when they come to you with a complaint is they just want to be heard. They just want to be listened to. They don't necessarily want you to fix anything, but they want you to acknowledge whatever it is that they got going on. They may ask you for help. They may ask for something, you know, to fix their situation. But I find that I've worked in so many different pet shop environments that they don't get heard. They get, you know, they immediately get labeled a complainer when it could be something so easily fixed. And then that client, you still retain that client. You don't push that client out the door. And that's how I've developed a lot of relationships. Most of my clients have become my friends. I, you know, we get to know each other and we're on more of a friendship level, not just, you're just my client. And I like to teach that. I like to train that. I like to I don't expect people to be all in your personal life 100%, but to have um, a camaraderie, a relationship with your client is very helpful or an open door policy where they understand that they can come to you and talk to you about something and you're not going to get defensive and you're not going to get, you know, upset with them. I mean, it could be something as simple as, hey, my dog needed, I find, you know, I used to ask this question especially when I get the clients that come to me and they go, well, I, I've, you know, I just can't find the right groomer. And I'm always could never understand that. I'm like, what do you mean you can't find the right groomer? What's what, what does that, what does that look like for you? And they would say, well, you know, they, they cut my dog way too short. And I, I was so mad. And I said, well, did you tell them? Well, no, I'm just going to go somewhere else. And I said, but if you don't ever tell them, they will never know what they did. And you just never came back. And he goes, well, I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to tell them. So I try to teach my clients as well. And I try to train my franchisees to have that open door communication where, Hey, I'm doing your dog in the haircut that we've described, but Hey, if it's a little bit too short or a little bit too long, let me know. I can always adjust that on the next grooming. If it's too long, I can fix it before your pet leaves. Um, I want you to be happy. I want them to know that they can openly talk to myself, a groomer and fix that situation. And then people walk away happy. 
I find that there's a lot of the, the customer service industry is, is not real strong sometimes in, in grooming. I don't look at my clients as a number. Those are their babies. Those are their, yeah. they want, they want them to be cared for and uh, they don't want them to be hurt. And I just feel like my, op, what I'm able to offer is a little bit more of a hands-on experience. It's not just, I'm a business person and I'm creating this. Right. I've actually had my hands in it in multiple ways. Customer, good and bad. Service. Customer service is good to have for sure. Especially right. in this day and age. Like I feel like sometimes we get stumbled upon that. What have you found successful as far as your marketing? As far as marketing goes, Facebook ads. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that type of, you know, ad, I'm not as, I'm not real good at that myself. It's not my strong suit, but I find that I get a little bit more um, inquiries. I have placed ads in like magazines. They're hit or miss. I get a few. Now, is look. this for B2C or B2B? Well, B2C, our advertising is very small because our Billboard is our trucks yeah. and it tends to bring in a ton of, we don't do a whole lot of, we do a lot of more guerrilla type marketing and relationship building to launch our businesses. Obviously we have backup marketing plans that we, that we have in place um, so that they have options to utilize. Ads then are for more people to bring in for franchises. Correct. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Because yeah. You know, that's where I struggle with the lead generation. I've tried portals for me that, again, I'm a one, I'm, I'm myself, so I don't have a, a sales team necessarily. I mean, I'm very, you know, my, I'm a very, but I call myself a boutique type franchise. Mm -hmm. I'm very hands-on myself. Obviously that will change as time evolves, but right now I really like to hand walk my franchisees through this process and really spend the a lot of time with them, make sure that they're growing, make sure they're hitting their numbers. And they, and I get to offer that in the early stages. Obviously when I get older, things will have to change. I probably have to hire people to have to help me in that department, but same thing with sales. But right now I, I have to kind of manage it myself. So the business to business is I do a lot of that more or less internet type marketing. Yeah. Yep. You have to, for sure just to keep, you know, it in front of a, a variety of people that I would never meet from all over, from wherever you choose to target market. Now, yeah. those are kind of a, a thing I think work best for me. Magazines, they can be pricey, but I don't think I've ever gotten a lead out of a magazine ad. Sure. Well, <laughs> I, I think magazines are, are something, I mean, they're good and bad, but if you're reaching an audience in a different way, it's not going to be beneficial. Like I can see like home like advisor people, you know, like remodeling people, they can do really good because their their profit margins are also way higher, right? And so they right. can, they can afford that kind of thing and reach the homes that like go into like when it goes into their homes in direct mail or magazines that go in like that. Like that is when it can work good for those types of people, right? Um, whereas if it's just a magazine sitting out somewhere, it's not really going to get as much traction. Even even if it's an online magazine too, if they say, oh, well, you're going to do ads on you uh, for online it's not always the best, right? And so there's that fine line of figuring out what is going to work for you and your company. And that's that's what makes marketing so unique is because not everything is the same for everybody. I mean, even if I worked with franchisors and they want to bring in more leads from um, for their franchise, what works for them isn't going to always work for the next person, right? And so we right. have to understand that because that's why I love talking to people because so many people have such great different ideas of how they have achieved what they have as far as, you know, having multiple upon multiple um, multi-units. Right. Which are one of those things you wish you had. Again, um, we don't call it, I, I mean, we use the word sales, but I like to use the word award, awarding, because yeah. truthfully, I, just because somebody comes with money doesn't right. mean they get to buy into my franchise. Um, I really feel like they kind of need to be handpicked as well as Absolutely. they choose me just because it needs to be a good fit. And again, I'm all about that relationship and we have to like each other at the end of the day. <laughs> I don't want to form a relationship with somebody that I don't get along with. That would be really difficult and make, make that relationship very hard. 
Um, oh, it will, yes. And I think that's fair to say, you know, they're filtering you, but you're also filtering them. And you can usually tell if you guys are going to vibe together and be good together for one another and have that energy and connection right up front. Because if you don't have that, it's going to be hard going forward for sure. Right. And that's a long, you know, 10 years is a long time to have to have a relationship with somebody that they don't even start day one on the right foot, you know? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We don't want that. (laughs) (laughs) We don't. All right. Well, perfect. Thanks so much for coming on. Um, If anybody wants to connect with you, how can they find you? Well, I have uh, Facebook. We have Paparazzi Mobile Pet Spa Fan Club, um, where you can go and see some of our information. I have a website. It's www.paparazzimobile.com. Um, I don't know if you'll be able to post that in the links, um, actual website. So I don't have to spell it because people won't know how to spell it. Um, Yeah, that's fine. And then my cell number, just, you can always contact me direct. I'm very open. Um, I, it's my cell. It comes right to me. It's what I take for business calls. It's 623-332-8116. Thank you, everybody, for listening in on today's Brand Clarity episode with Susie Libertor. Two things. First and foremost, please, if you liked this episode, please subscribe and leave some positive reviews. Also, don't forget to sign up for Stop Sending Your Customers to the Competition and get my insider secrets to compelling branding that converts. You can find that at branding-bridge.com. It's a free workbook for you to check out right now all of the branding techniques and strategies that I use for my paying clients.